Listen to that. <sighs> Getting rough out there. The waves are picking up. And that's gotta mean landfall. You're on the A-list, right? You got Down Syndrome so bad, you probably got Up, Left, and Right Syndrome too. Shalom, my fellow individuals. Monster Hunter is one of those series that I just keep going back to from time to time. It started on the PlayStation 2, but my first one was Try. By the way, have you ever seen the commercials for Try? Those were wild. Capcom got a Viking to call Deadliest Catch gay. Previously on Deadliest Hunters. After 36 days at sea, our relentless heroes work a day and night to get through as many traps as possible. Are you kidding me? I do not get it. I mean, what's so deadly about a wee bit of crab fishing? Are they trapping giant sea beasties with deadly venomous fangs? Or electric fire breathing creatures with razor blade claws? No! They're catching itty bitty crabbies! Be careful, ladies. One of these things might give you a might nasty punch. There are two things that make Monster Hunter special. The first one is that back in the day, this was the closest console players got to having an MMO. For the second, the boss fights are the main attraction. You don't fight them at the end of a dungeon or anything like that. I'm going to check out one of the more interesting entries, World. It could be considered to be a reboot of the series. A ton of stuff got changed and some decisions angered longtime fans. Let's get into it by starting with the graphics. It feels so good to have another Monster Hunter game on something more powerful than a handheld. I don't have to worry about getting eye strain. The views and locations here are pretty rad. Seliana is a winter wonderland. Take a look at the Coral Highlands map. It's pretty neat. Moving through snow causes it to deform. Particle effects are also quite strong. Overall, I enjoyed the graphics and there's very little for me to complain about. I wish that they were able to prevent the armor clipping, but I can live with it. For the soundtrack, I thought I was not going to enjoy it at first, but it did grow on me. When the victory theme comes on once you defeated an elder dragon, it's great. It really makes me feel like I killed a higher being. World's character creator is not bad at all. In fact, the character creators in the series have always been decent at the very least, and they don't even have to be. This isn't a life simulator or an RPG with branching paths. Similar to Diablo clones, it's the armor that you're going to be seeing a lot of. Look at Grim Dawn. The only thing you can customize there is whether or not your character rubs a sausage or a bean. So getting into the gameplay, the characters it's talk now, job. and... Let's do a quick review of quest well... Moves. It's like nature meant for us to build a stair right here. This is the last bastion! No more second chances! If Zora Magdaros breaches the barrier, all is lost! Something oh. Jakey's eats a barrel! Believe you me, I get it. Anything could happen to us, but hey, that's yep. happened. Uh. Hey, aren't you one of the A-list hunters? Okay, let's get the story out of the way now, so we don't have to talk about it later. Compared to the previous entries, World has a larger emphasis on the story. The plot is basically man versus nature. In the base game, it's finding out what's up with Zora Magdaros. For Iceborne, it's finding out what's up with the Legiana. And somewhere in between, Jerome of Krakow shows up. Due to the larger emphasis on the story, the pacing took a hit. For comparison, Freedom Unite gets going fast. Opening cutscene, move around, read some text, bam, you get to play. World takes quite a while. There's about an hour of scripted sequences and cutscenes you have to go through before you really get to start playing. To be fair, World isn't the only Monster Hunter game that took its time. Try and 4 forced you to do a tutorial. 
How are the characters? Well, you have funny jokester guy, serious lady, guts from berserk, cool old man, cool old woman, old leader guy, steroids man, knife ear that likes to get high, mystical philosophical knife ear, and then there's the handler. We'll get to the handler, don't worry. They have the pieces for interesting characters here, but they do not do much with them. Take Guts, for instance. In Iceborne, there's hinting that he's worried about taking over the commander role, but nothing really comes out of it. Then there's the serious lady. Why is she so serious? Was there something that happened in her past to make her the way she is? Did she experience a traumatic event to steal her nerves? Nope, nothing. Does the commander worry about the possibility that one mistake could cost him the lives of countless men and women under his management? Don't worry about it. Something I found surprising is that very few people die or are shown to die. At the start of the game, Zora Magdaros destroys the ship you arrive on, so it's safe to say at least one person died from that. For the lore of some monsters, they are said to have killed civilizations and people, but again, we don't see that. What we do get to see a lot of is monsters bodying and killing other monsters. This puts me in a funny position. One of my pet peeves in any medium is to have humans and other sentient life die or implied to die in really gruesome ways. But then like creatures like dogs and cats get off scot-free. World is trying to make up for other things doing that. Capcom did not want a dark or gritty plot here. That's great, there's nothing wrong with that. But they still should have tried to flesh out the characters more or make things more entertaining. Mario RPG and Ratchet and Clank also have lighthearted, not very serious stories. And they're way better than the one here. Since this Monster Hunter had more emphasis on the story, you would think Capcom would go all out, especially given their track record with Devil May Cry and Resident Evil. Come on, throw in some dumb fun stuff, like cults worshipping various monsters as gods. Have some cool man or woman ride a Rathalos into battle and have air jousting. Dead Rising had a dual chainsaw wielding clown. When you see something like that, you do not look at the world the same way again. I practically never see anyone talk about the NPCs in these games. A lot of people just don't care, but I do. I'm one of those weirdos that go out of the way to talk to everyone in a game's world. Some of the NPCs have their own personalities or even their own little arcs. You've got one such as a buff cat and this guy that you help with growing a tree. Another thing I found interesting was that the characters did not really get into conflicts with each other. On one hand, this hurts characterization and depth. For example, one character could have a distrust of authority figures, because a commander in the old world sent their parent on a mission, resulting in their parent's death. Therefore, this character would distrust the commander in world and prefer to be a lone wolf. On the other hand, this is refreshing. You don't have to deal with drama, like having two guys go, Back home, our countries are at war. We can't be seen hanging out at Dunkin' Donuts together. That's not cool. You are part of a unit. We are all one big happy family helping each other out. Everything is going to turn out great. I've put off talking about the handler long enough. Not since Slippy the Toad from Star Fox have I seen so many people get booty blasted by a video game character. You'd think she committed a heinous war crime based on how much heat she's gotten. Honestly, I'm pretty neutral on her. She's quirky, loves to eat, and eager. Plus, she gets herself into a lot of trouble. There's that one time she almost gets destroyed by Devil Joe. I have to wonder if the hate might be due to a cultural thing. In Jelly Donut Media, you tend to see a lot of characters like the Handler, especially in animation. Here in Burgerland, you don't really see anything like her outside of comedies or media explicitly for children and families. Another thing that might be going on is what I'm going to call the Two Links problem. See, in The Legend of Zelda, most of the games have you play as Link. He's supposed to be the player's avatar. However, he still acts in his own way. I'm pretty sure I would have a stroke and die in the forest and shadow temples of Ocarina of Time. But Link is cool with it. 
This is a normal occurrence for him. If I survived the Deku Tree and did not burn to death in Dodongo's Cavern, I would have definitely given up when I learned I had to get Vored by Jabu Jabu, even though I would have gotten a busty mermaid GF out of it. I would start thinking Ganondorf is not such a bad guy. He just wants what's best for his people. Maybe if the Hillians gave him fishing rights at Lake Hylia, and he gained access to the unused mines of the Gorons, there would be no war. In World, your character is also a player avatar and does not talk. It seems like the handler is the surrogate or stand-in for the audience, but she doesn't act like a normal person. Plus, she's not that compelling and you cannot really argue she is the main character either. The plot is more about stuff happening and characters reacting to it. This is why a lot of people have Wind Waker's Link as their favorite incarnation of Link. There, he's very expressive and has a personality. He does not even start out with wanting to save the world, he just wants to save his sister. A major plot point for the Handler is that she went to the New World to continue her grandpa's legacy. What if the story was rewritten to take that into account more? The Handler could be some down-on-her-luck woman that works for the Monster Hunting Guild. Your character would basically be assigned to work with the Dud. The Handler could be the laughing stock of her family, but it's her drive to finish what her grandpa started that helps her succeed. In a way, this was the plot of Klonoa 2 if you boiled it down to the basics. Klonoa is basically a dream janitor that cleans up messes. Lolo calls upon him to help her out, but over the course of the game, you find out that Lolo is dealing with some stuff. There are still way worse characters out there anyway, like Lightning from Final Fantasy XIII, Eric Sparrow from Tony Hawk Underground, and Aiden Pierce from Watch Dogs. The Handler at least has some redeeming qualities. She does genuinely care about others. When you go up against Velkana, she actually worries about your character's well-being. Still, Capcom could have given the Handler more roles, since she deals with the bureaucracy side of the setting. Maybe they could have her collect items for you. She's already paying your taxes so you're not just a murder hobo. Just have her say she's been pulling some strings and throwing shekels at the right people behind the scenes. That way she would fulfill a good story and gameplay role. In regards to the story, it's nothing special. The only thing to note is that a ton of people got filtered by what might be a genuine autistic woman. But for me, to quote a famous musician, I'd still hit if I could. If you were disappointed by the plot in this game, Watch Babylon 5, it's way better. The weapons in Monster Hunter are moist. I am dead serious when I say that it deserves to go into the Gaming Hall of Fame for this alone. Have you ever played a first or third person shooter where you start off with a pistol, then as soon as you get an assault rifle or a shotgun, you practically never use the pistol again? That does not really happen in Monster Hunter. All the weapons are viable. They each have their own pros and cons. Plus, every weapon has tech. Lances can execute a special running move and chain that into an attack. Great swords can perform a charged attack sequence. When it comes to the ranged weapons, it's almost like you're playing a different game. The series also has creative weapon choices. Have you ever wanted to experience the Pike and Shaw era of warfare in a fantasy setting? The Gun Lance has you covered. Did you ever want to LARP as Darth Maul with ADHD? Then the Insect Glaive is for you. It gives you a lot of verticality. Furthermore, you can even cultivate your own Kinsex for added customization. Then there's the Hunting Horn. It's a bit unconventional. You perform combos to play music. These combos will provide buffs to you and your party members. Some people do not care for this weapon, but I always appreciate it when I see someone using it. All melee weapons need to worry about sharpness. Over the course of a fight, the sharpness will degrade, lowering your damage output and causing your hits to bounce off more. This means that you will have to occasionally find the time for breathing room and resharpen using a whetstone. A design point I always respected was that the game does not pause or slow down when you check or use your items in battle. 
Weapons can deal elemental damage and status effects. If you favor the dual blades or the bow, you want to be constantly chugging down dash juice. Ranged weapons can use different ammo types. Bow guns can be further customized with add-ons. In addition to your loadout are specialized tools. They are items that work on a cooldown. Over the course of the game, I came to favor three of them. The first one was the health booster. You just plop it down and everyone within the area of effect will be healed. For the second, it was the temporal mantle. It will give you free dodges for a period of time. My last favorite was the rock steady mantle. Alongside lowering damage, it made you invulnerable to flinching and getting stunned. A funny thing about the temporal mantle is that I think Capcom did not play test it enough because they eventually released an update that gave it a huge nerf. Originally, it allowed you to dodge attacks for the entire period it was active. Now, every time it gives you a dodge, the time you are allowed to use it gets lowered. In my opinion, the Gilly Mantle is the weakest tool in the game. It allows you to enter stealth mode, which is not that useful. This is not a game where, while in stealth, you can one-shot an enemy. Since World overhauled the franchise, what has it done to address the clunk and tedium? Before that, we have to talk about the difference between dumbing down and streamlining. An example of a series being dumbed down is Mass Effect. The first game had equipment management, and the sequels removed that. Mass Effect really ended up like that Japanese cartoon Naruto. Both of them just got worse as they went on. In the older titles, you had to keep track of your items to gather resources. For example, you could not get any minerals without a pickaxe. Also, you had to manage your whetstones. Now, you no longer have to manage those things. This is streamlining. Dumbing down would be removing resource gathering entirely. For me, this was a great change. I get to spend less time in menus and focus more on the action. In the older games, the maps where the hunts took place were broken up into segments. If you changed areas, you had to deal with a loading screen. World made the segments seamless. Before you go out on a mission, you should always eat for the buffs it gives. However, if you forget, the hunting maps will have a table you can use. If you want to, you can choose to make your own meal for further min-maxing. On to the stars of the show, the monsters. Some creatures will attack you on sight, and others will be cool until you make the first strike. It would have been very easy to make everything instantly aggro upon seeing you. Capcom deserves praise for going out of their way to add variety in this area. Every monster has their own set of attacks and abilities. They cannot be brute forced either. You have to learn their patterns and know when to dodge and weave. Some will shoot fire. Others can cause status effects such as poison. Roars could stop you in your tracks. Parts of their body can be damaged. Tails can be severed. Traps can be used against them. When you finally beat them, you get to extract resources off of them that can be used to craft weapons and armor. I'll never know what it's like for a line of infantry to break, but I do know the fear of God when fighting Rajang. When you perform an aerial attack on a large monster, there is a chance you will mount it. While in this state, you try to hold on while stabbing the beast. If you stay on long enough, you will knock down the monster and get an opening for attacks. Some flying enemies can be brought down with the use of a flash pod. Depending on what you are fighting, some cool stuff can happen. When you get the health of a Raging Bracky Dios low enough, it will flee to a specific part of the map. Once there, it will lock everyone in and start spreading a ton of slime on the ground. After a certain point, Raging Bracky Dios will detonate the slime, causing an explosion that will even damage itself. It knows it's cornered and it's just doing anything it can to survive. Then there's enemies such as Valhazak, where, for me, it's their gimmick that make them hard. Valhazak can cause an effect that cuts your health in half. 
At least with Valhazok, since it's an Elder Dragon, you can use weapons that have the Elder Seal trait. This will limit the powers of an Elder Dragon. Depending on your weapon, some enemies are easier to fight than others. For example, I found Kirin harder to deal with when using slower weapons. It's like Kirin is playing a real-time game and you are playing a turn-based one. Still, it's not impossible to win with an unsuited weapon. This is why I love this series so much. Enemies are challenging, but the difficulty is fair. Hunts can be dynamic. Other beasts could show up and you will have to rethink your strategy. When I fight a difficult monster and I figure out what to do, oh man, it's like a drug. It's entering this trance-like state, getting into the zone. Get a team of people that know what they're doing and it's like magic. Plus, the fact you can use whatever weapon you want means you are bound to get a different experience from someone else. Seeing other people discuss their playthroughs of Monster Hunter is like soldiers trading war stories. Back in the day, there were times where I joined a lobby of random people, a particular monster just completely destroying us, and us all agreeing to start fighting dirty. Everyone equipped their favorite weapon, loaded up on traps, and went to town. We poisoned it, put it to sleep, bombed it, you name it. If you know anything about this game, you might have noticed that I've neglected to talk about some things. Rounding out your arsenal are the Clutch Claw and Slinger. The Clutch Claw allows you to attach yourself to monsters. From there, you can then perform this attack that lets you tenderize a part of the body, allowing you to do more damage to that area. Cool, right? Here's why the Clutch Claw is iffy. It encourages you to play a certain way and homogenizes the hunts. If you do not use it, you are going to be at a disadvantage. You will deal less damage. This also led to an unfortunate side effect. The Clutch Claw is better suited to multiplayer, because some players could focus on causing damage, while others focus on softening up parts. When the servers go down, people wanting to check out the single player are going to have a harder time. In my opinion, Monster Hunter Generations handled spicing things up better. Generations added an ability system. There were multiple abilities you could use. Plus, they could be mixed and matched. So, if you want to argue that you are forced to use the abilities in Generations, you could also argue that it had variety. Now, I'm going to be honest. I do not think the Clutch Claw ruins world. A problem that every long-running franchise faces is that it's not just competing with other products on the market, it's also competing with past versions of itself. Capcom wanted to add something that would keep things fresh, but also not stray too far. It's not like they could have made a triple fusion of the zipline from Just Cause 2, the combat of Monster Hunter, and the mobility of a Spoderman. That would be a completely different game. If there were multiple types of clutch claws you could use, I think it would have been better. For example, a vampire one that restores health for as long as you are connected to a monster, or a heavy claw that brings flying monsters to the ground. As for the slinger, it's alright. I can shoot a rock at a god. It also lets me wall slam monsters with the claw. Doubling as an appeal to furries and your AI party member are Palikos. They can be equipped with their own sets of armor and weapons. Furthermore, they can use gadgets to assist you in hunts, and pretty much all of them are pretty good. There's one for healing, stunning enemies, buffing you, distracting monsters, helping with farming resources, and one for dealing damage. This might be why you only have one Palico ally in single player. Two would completely break the game in half. The gadgets get upgraded as they are used, giving them more functionality. If you want more of a challenge, you can also leave your Palico behind. Despite the name, Monster Hunter is lacking in the overall hunting experience. This series focuses more on the combat than other things. If you're expecting L.A. Noir but with monsters, you will be disappointed. 
in the old games, you used these items called paintballs to track enemies. Now, as you collect research on a monster, the game will automatically start finding them for you. I always wonder why they bother making creatures with a pack gimmick. The smaller enemies do not pose much of a threat to you. Furthermore, why can I not poison a nest or taint the drinking water to make fighting a certain monster easier or more interesting? Let's say before I go on a hunt to kill a Diablos, I can place Doritos where it sleeps. Now, when I fight that Diablos, it will deal 25% less damage or it will take 25% more damage. When I want to fight a Brachydios, let's say I forgot to read the wiki and I gave it Mountain Dew. As a result, that Brachydios is harder to fight, but it might give me better rewards. I know that tainted meats are a thing, but those have a temporary effect. What I'm suggesting is a permanent modifier for the hunt. Since a major theme for world is science and ecology, I wonder if this thought crossed anyone's mind during development. I do not think this would be that difficult to balance. You can make it so that it always costs an item to do what I'm suggesting. Plus, players that want bragging rights can ignore this feature entirely, or choose to make the fights harder. From what I've said, it might seem as if I do not enjoy anything about the hunting experience, but I do. After you have crippled a monster for life, you get the chance to capture it. Place down a trap, throw some tranks, and there you go. Capturing should be preferred in my opinion. It gives you a chance to get more rare materials. Upon meeting each other, certain monsters will start gang wars. It really makes the game seem more alive. This is also a desirable outcome because one or both will take damage from it. I also enjoyed a lot of the hunting maps. The first one, the Ancient Forest, might be my favorite map in the game. It's large with a lot of winding paths. I had fun getting lost in it. Plus, the locations have great varied theming. The Elder's Recess has this area with giant crystal formations. Next door to that is a volcanic region. At the Wild Spire Waste, you have a desert area with large rocks jutting out of the ground. Far off from that is a forested area. Compared to the previous games, there are no separate single player and multiplayer sets of quests. The missions are separated into three ranks, Low, High, and Master. Each rank increases the difficulty and the rarity of materials you can get. Monsters are missing parts of their movesets on the lower tiers, meaning that you'll be eased into the ball busting or glitch stretching. In the older entries, some quests had two objectives, primary and secondary. They removed the secondary objectives for quests here. For the old games, if a run was going sour, you could try going for plan B and dip, so botching a mission would not be a complete failure. Also, the variety in the main quest line could have been better. Practically all of the main missions have you kill the current big monster in the story. For the older games, you had to complete specific quests in order to go on to the next set and they were more than just fantasy population control. Here, the side quests have a nice variety. Why couldn't the same be done for the main set? When I got to the Iceborne portion, I found the main missions to be a slog to get through. I'm not complaining about it being difficult or challenging. Those are fine. It's just that since the monsters take so long to beat at this point, and there's little variety beyond that, I found myself getting burnt out. Like some kind of pleb, I had to put down the game and take breaks. Luckily, there are times where the game will have you perform side quests or gather evidence in order to advance. Speaking of the difficulty, I found it to be very backloaded. The tail end of this game is just on another level compared to the rest. Look at this, look at how fast this guy moves. Do you see how much damage that deals? After fighting Raging Brachydios and Furious Rajang, I went back and fought a Master Ranked Teostra. 
as long as Teostra did not get me into a stunlock combo and I was patient, I have a much easier time with it. Either the last set of monsters have to be brought down in difficulty, or everything else has to be brought up. Fatalis and Elatrion are very challenging. Elatrion requires you to make a build around it. If you do not perform enough elemental damage, you are going to lose. And Fat Atlas... I am compelled to say obscenities. I do not want to say that Fat Atlas and Elatrion are bad because I did not enjoy them. I just think there are better spectacle fights in the series. Jed Moren is one of them. You start off by fighting it on a sandboat, then you transition to fighting it on foot. Finally, some of the stuff involving Zora Magdaros had strange quirks. For example, in this one, in order to progress, you have to destroy specific parts of the body. However, if you accomplish that too fast, you just have to wait. That's very polite. I've always wanted a free play mode. Certain strategy games let you generate a map or scenario with custom conditions. What I'm asking for is something similar to that. Basically, allow players to create their own quests with their own parameters. Let them use any equipment in the game, regardless of whether or not it was unlocked. Give players the option to create absolute cancer, like making every Baroth attack inflict poison. Maybe let players share these scenarios online too. Things like this are just stuff I think about on occasion. Another one is, when I die, could a necromancer hustle a deity to get me out of heaven? Can they go to Ganesha to talk to the Jewish god to kick me out? This keeps me up at night. While in the hub areas, you can only interact with other players in designated areas. Although you can have a ton of players on at one time, it would have been nice to see others in any location. Also, it's possible to trade items, but it's very limited. Any items past a certain rank cannot be traded. Sadly, there is also no cross-platform multiplayer. One day, I hope the series gets that. The main quest line, as well as some other quests, have this very strange quirk. In World, you have to wait for the leader to trigger a certain cutscene before other players get to join. Even Star Wars The Old Republic handled this better. In The Old Republic, if you are in a group with someone entering one of their story missions, you can join them right from the start, help them kill any enemies that show up, and watch any cutscenes that might be encountered. Capcom never patched this, by the way. I wonder why they made it work like this. When you are in the field, you can fire an SOS flare. This will allow anyone to join you, regardless of what server they are on. The only thing I have to complain about is that displaying them could be better. You cannot see all available SOS quests at once. This game has crafting, all right. Every piece of armor has a set of traits, so you can mix and match what you want to use. On top of the traits, you can slot in decorations for even more power gaming. Furthermore, armor spears can be used to upgrade your armor's defense. As with many crafting systems, it can be tedious to acquire the needed resources. On the bright side, there are ways to make gathering things easier. Expeditions are when you go to a hunting map without a quest. Random creatures will show up and you can stay there for as long as you want. There is a growing area for specific items. In addition, you can use what's called the Argosi. It will give you randomly selected items. You might not bother with it that much when you first unlock it. I really started using it when I got near the end of high rank and the start of master rank. Another thing you can do is hire Palikos to have a chance at getting certain items. Investigations are another way of getting materials. They have the chance of giving you higher rated items. 
With the rise of Minecraft, Terraria, and open world survival crafters, I think Capcom deserves praise for not making Monster Hunter jump on that trend. That shows confidence and integrity in your product. I'm still surprised Splatoon was not another Mario game. Imagine how many times the younger staff at Nintendo had to send the Yakuza after Shiggy Diggy Miyamoto to make Splatoon its own thing. Think about this for a moment. Capcom is already a part of the way there with a satisfying combat system, which would give them an edge over other survival crafting games. So all they would have to do is implement base building features. Monsters could easily be set to spawn in specific biomes too. There's an alternate dimension out there where a monster hunter craft or builders exists, and Minecraft and Terraria lived on in obscurity. For as much streamlining as World did, there are still some ways that Capcom could optimize the crafting. Although there are ways to automate getting certain materials, you still have to go out of your way to collect them. What if those items could be dumped directly into my inventory? That way, it could be fire and forget. After you beat the story's final boss in Iceborne, you unlock the Guiding Lands. Here's how it basically works. You fight a ton of monsters to raise area levels and gather special materials. At a certain level, stronger versions of monsters will start showing up. You want to fight them because they will give you even more special materials. These materials are needed to further upgrade your armor and weapons. Although you can beat the game without engaging with this, you are intended to do it for the higher levels of Iceborne. Those mad lads at Capcom added farming on top of farming. You are already going to spend a ton of time getting the armor and weapons you want to use. If you want to stand a better chance against the high-end content, you have to spend even more time upgrading. Still, I would not call this bad. Depending on how you want to look at it, you can see it as some sort of infinite dungeon. It's a nice way to test your skills without going on a quest. This brings me to my next point, it's time to talk about shekels. A lot of games have problems with how they handle currency. You are bound to encounter one where you will end up with a ton of money and have nothing to spend it on. Monster Hunter is no different. By the end game, you will be swamped with cash. Some people are going to want to shoot me for this. I think they should remove money from the series or allow you to buy materials using your in-game currency. The latter would cut down on time spent farming and let you focus more on playing the actual game. Let's finish things off with the user experience. I found the original town, Astera, to be tedious to navigate. Let's say you just finished a multiplayer hunt in the Astera hub and you finally got enough materials to craft a new piece of equipment. You have to first interact with an object that will allow you to change areas. Select the workshop. Wait. Go to the necessary NPC. Talk to them. Speed on through some dialogue. Now you can do what you want to do. My favorite area was Celiana because the gathering hub has things laid out in a more convenient way, and I enjoyed the design of the area. The research base also has an efficient layout. Another thing is why have a separate character for buying weapons and crafting? Wouldn't it be more efficient to just use one? The person you can buy equipment from does not even sell anything beyond the basics. This is a problem you run into with world design. It's a battle between what's natural and what's convenient for the player. Although I can tolerate jank and clunk, I can see someone getting put off by the more tedious aspects. I know someone that actually dropped the game because he found navigating the menus to be that much of a problem. We're approaching the end and there's a bunch of stuff I could complain about. I could say that Yian Garuga should have been in base Iceborne. It shows up at the end, getting top billing, and it's not on the same level as the rest of Iceborne's endgame. In the end, I had a fun time with World. 
It has what I enjoy about the series, but it also introduced some problems that were never there to begin with. And whether or not it was intentional to make the handler autistic is a subject the great gaming philosophers need to tackle. I will say that World is a good enough starting point for the series. Still, if you end up enjoying it, and you do want to play the older entries, you'll have to readjust to them. So I'm going to leave it like this. If you are someone that tends to have long, difficult days at work and or school, and if you do choose to play a game, you want to unwind and relax, maybe even go as far to turn off your brain, I do not think this is the series for you. However, if you enjoy a challenge, then yeah, I recommend checking it out. You might enjoy it. In World, there's a side quest where you help an old man out by taking a picture of a woman so he can have lewd thoughts about her. Hmm, let me see. Excellent work! This is the best Monster Hunter game ever made.